So welcome back everybody, uh, part two, part four of the SOS tutorial, part two of Ankur. Go for it. Great, so thanks for coming back. So last time we did extremal combinatorics and I wanna continue this theme of explaining how SOS is related to other disciplines. We talked about extremal combinatorics and this time uh, we're gonna roll up our sleeves and do quantum mechanics, but without bras and cats. So uh, actually the first thing I wanna do is I wanna introduce a complementary view to uh, what Pablo introduced in the first two parts of this tutorial. So there's another way to think about SOS, which is actually very useful for both rounding SOS, getting algorithms out of it, which is something really interesting that all sorts of people are working on, and even how to prove lower bounds for uh, things like planted clique. So let me introduce this dual view of SOS. So this is um, what we'll be using throughout this talk. Which is called a pseudo expectation. It's something that masquerades as an expectation but isn't. It only has some of the consistency checks. So the way to think about it, let me just define it. And this is, you know, going to be a little bit of a mouthful, but uh, such is life. So what's going to happen is we think about an operator that takes any polynomial of degree at most d in n variables, and it maps it to some real value. Now, of course, um, the expectation is something that could do that. Like if you think about some distribution of values for your variables x1 through xn, then if you give me a polynomial, I could just compute the expectation of that polynomial on those, that distribution of variables. The pseudo expectation is gonna act like that. So it'll have many of the same properties about an expectation. So for example, E tilde is gonna be linear. After all, the expectation would be. So if you give me two polynomials, P and Q, and I look at E tilde of P plus Q, it better be equal to E tilde of P plus E tilde of Q. Fine. So the other thing is that, um, you know, if you gave me the polynomial one, and this was a polynomial that, you know, is in principle in variables X1 through Xn, we're thinking about a distribution on those variables being set, but I ask you, what's the expectation of one? That better be one. So E tilde of one is one. Now this is the thing where all of the action is really happening, is whenever you give me a polynomial P, and I look at the pseudo expectation of its square, that it better be non-negative. Now this is only gonna make sense as long as the degree of the polynomial is at most d over two, because the pseudo expectation operator is only defined out to degree d polynomials. So this is also something that um, you know, would certainly be true for the expectation. I, again, I give you a distribution on values for x1 through xn. You give me a polynomial, well you take the square of that polynomial and compute the expectation, better get something non-negative. So these are the general constraints. You know, this is another view of SOS. These are the constraints that you impose on a pseudo expectation operator, regardless of what problem you want to solve. Now there are some specific constraints that you impose depending on the particular problem you care about. So in general, you remember that uh, SOS is a relaxation for general polynomial optimization. So one of the things that you could have in your polynomial optimization problem is you could have an equality constraint where you have some polynomial Q of X and you want that Q of X is equal to zero on all of the solutions you look at. This vector X is really X1 up to Xn. So that's some sort of constraint in your polynomial optimization problem and the way that this gets translated into some sort of constraint in the pseudo expectation is that you force that E tilde of P times Q had better be equal to zero for all things which meet this degree bound, that you're only evaluating it on degree up to D things. So if you want that any solution you find 
satisfies the constraint q of x equals 0, then the way that you impose that within the pseudo expectation view is you just say that any polynomial p you give me, which the total degree inside here is so that my pseudo expectation operator is still defined, you want that e tilde of p times q had better be equal to 0. And the last thing, so I'm really just going to state these general constraints, but then we're going to roll up our sleeves and look at what they look like in particular contexts. The last type of constraint you can think about for SOS is you might have a constraint that for all of your solutions you want q of x is non-negative. And the way that this gets translated into a constraint on your pseudo expectation operator <coughs> is that for all polynomials p, you want the pseudo expectation of p squared times q to be non-negative. So these are the problem specific constraints. So this is the way that you write down an SOS relaxation. You take your favorite polynomial optimization problem. And then what you do is instead of looking for, you know, you relax it by instead of looking for a solution, you could look at a distribution on solutions to your optimization problem. And then you relax that even further because you could look at something called the pseudo distribution, which satisfies all of these constraints that the distribution on solutions would satisfy, but it only satisfies these consistency checks up to some degree d. So it's a higher and higher level of self-consistency in this thing that's trying to masquerade like a distribution. So this is you know, a mouthful any way you look at it. This is a laundry list of constraints. But this is what you've got to do every time you talk about using SOS either for upper or lower bounds. Now what I promised you is I want to explain you know, how SOS says something about quantum. And actually how quantum information theory has a lot to do with understanding the power of SOS as you go to higher and higher levels in your relaxation. So that's what I'm going to do. The first thing is, um, you know, I'm going to prove, a, I'm going to kind of prove um, a result which you can state without quantum about polynomial optimization. And the way that I'm going to do it is to illustrate a really important principle within sum of squares. So <clears throat> the principle I want to illustrate is that, um, let's see, let's say this. is really how to go about designing an algorithm for some optimization problem you care about via SOS. This on the left hand side is just how to mechanically go through and create your relaxation, your convex program. But one of the important things is this principle, which I'll state now, but we'll see what this means uh, throughout this talk, is what you're going to do is you're going to pretend you actually have a distribution. And you fix your argument later. So you take your polynomial optimization problem, you write down this relaxation, you solve it, and what you found from your convex program is some e tilde. Now that's not a distribution on solutions, but you're just going to pretend that it is a distribution on solutions, and if it was, you're going to figure out how to round it to one solution and not a distribution. Find one solution that works. And all of that will just be probabilistic reasoning. But at the end of the day, what you have is not a distribution. It's a pseudo distribution. And then you fix your argument later and make it, you know, all of the steps in it use just these basic properties that the pseudo expectation operator satisfies in how you did your rounding algorithm. So this is not made to make sense yet. This is just a roadmap of where we're going. And hopefully it'll make sense as we go through the ideas. So let me tell you a really nice theorem, which of um, Rock, Kellner, and Stoyer. I'm going to state the theorem, then I'll tell you how it relates to quantum, and then we'll give a proof along these lines using this principle. So the idea is that uh, you're given a non-negative symmetric matrix. M, which is now going to be an R n squared by n squared. 
<clears throat> well, there's a quasi-polynomial time. There's a n to the log n over epsilon squared time <coughs> algorithm. To find a unit norm x, a Euclidean norm, that has the following property. So x is a length n vector. And we're going to take x, or x tensor with itself, so we get a length n squared vector. That's a unit vector. And we're going to look at that length n squared vector, its quadratic form on m. So that's the problem we want to solve. We find an x which has the property that it's close to the largest of any such form. So if you look at the max over all unit vectors of z tensor 2 quadratic form on m, that it's close to the max but off by something which depends on the spectral norm of m. So this is a really basic polynomial optimization problem. See, the fact that you're taking x, so x tensor 2 is not an arbitrary length n squared unit vector. After all, then this would be a really simple problem to solve. You would just take the largest eigenvector of the matrix. But x is constrained in that you, you know, the x tensor 2 is constrained, that it actually has to be um, the tensor of some length n vector with itself. So this, the way you should think about it is it's really like, you know, if you think about x1 through xn as being your original variables, it's like taking a degree 4 polynomial and then writing down the coefficients of that degree 4 polynomial into a matrix M that's n squared by n squared. And then this form right here, all it does, it takes that degree 4 polynomial and evaluates it on x. So instead of trying to maximize a quadratic function, you're trying to maximize something which is a fourth order, a degree 4 polynomial. So that's a polynomial optimization problem, which you can approximately optimally solve. You can get close to the maximum of that degree 4 polynomial on unit vector z. But you're off by something that depends on the spectral norm of the matrix. And as you decrease epsilon, the running time of your algorithm you know, goes up pretty badly. But you get a finer and finer approximation to this polynomial optimization problem. So this is a problem we're going to solve through sum of squares. But um, actually, first thing I want to do is I want to make good on this promise of why this is related to quantum mechanics. So we're going to see two relationships of this to quantum mechanics. So we'll do the first one for the time being. So you know, why is this related to quantum? So uh, just like. I don't do extremal combinatorics, but my last lecture was about it. I also don't do quantum. So let me give you a non-quantum person's view of quantum. So let's do that. So the first important thing is the notion of a quantum state. So what is this? So let's define it. So a quantum state rho. We'll think of it as being on some vector space Cn. Well, all it is is something rho lives actually in C n times n. So it's an n by n matrix. It has the property that it's PSD and it's trace is equal to 1. So there's this uh, phrase you hear. Yep? So just uh, one quick clarification. Is, the, is that the operator norm of M or the Frobenius norm? This is uh, spectral, so operator norm. Thanks. Um, so this is our notion of a quantum state. So sometimes you hear this expression that you know, quantum mechanics, you can see probability happening inside it if you restrict the diagonal matrices. So if for the moment you think about rho as being a diagonal matrix, right? so it has only zeros on the off diagonal, then it being PSD just means that it's entry-wise non-negative along the diagonal. And trace 1 just means that it sums to 1 along the diagonal. So it's really if you look at the diagonal, you get a probability distribution on n. Now, this is just an extension which allows you to 
you know, work with arbitrary PSD matrices. That's what a quantum state is. But it has lots of amazing properties like entanglement and things like this. But, um, <clears throat> you know, another equivalent way also to think about it, which is helpful to keep in mind, is this set of densities. So if I look at the set of all densities that meet this definition, that's nothing more than uh, the convex hull of x, x Hermitian, where x has norm 1. And x here is a vector in Cn. So one way to think about it is if I took such an x, which was a unit vector in, of length n in complex dimensional space, and I take it times its Hermitian, then what I get is definitely PSD. And its trace is 1 because the trace of x, x Hermitian is just the norm of x. And in fact, you can take the convex hull of any of those guys and still get a valid quantum state. And that's all the quantum states there are. It's just the convex hull of all vectors of this form. So now uh, let's get to something interesting, which is, see, quantum mechanics is funny. There are all sorts of you know, entanglement and cancellation and what have you. But there's a sense in which you can make a quantum state behave classically if you constrain it in some way. So that's the notion of a separable state. So this is the other key definition. So a state, rho, again in this, well, now it's going to be in a larger space. So we think instead of it being a n by n matrix, it's now an n squared by n squared matrix. But it's going to be separable if It's actually in a simpler set. So in the convex hull of row 1, tensor row 2, where these guys are quantum states in their own right. <coughs> so this is the crucial definition. So why this is important, it's a restriction on the set of all you know, quantum states in this, uh, which are n squared by n squared matrices. You want that you can represent it as a convex combination of row 1 and row 2, which are themselves valid quantum states. And so the way to think about this is that um, you know, that's the same thing as it being in the convex hull of x, x Hermitian, tensor y, y Hermitian. Again, with the you know, same thing that the norms of x and y are 1, and these are length n vectors. So what's important about separable states is that there's no entanglement. So a lot of times you have two separate quantum systems. And because entanglement can create such funny properties, if you think about like quantum two-prover games, for those of you who know complexity theory, a lot of times the difficulty in understanding whether a, a pair of players has a good strategy is in controlling the types of funny strategies that can come if they do have entanglement. So the name of the game is to prevent entanglement and to make the correlations between row 1 and row 2 just be purely classical correlations. And this is sort of an important concept in, in quantum and also in quantum, in quantum complexity. So just to understand how this polynomial optimization problem relates to this notion of separable states, let's figure it out. So here's the relation between the two. So let's say that m's spectral norm is at most 1. Then a lot of times you can, you know, what's really going on is that it's a quantum test. That measures some quantum state and comes out with some probabilities of various outcomes. Now, <clears throat> if the state is real, you know, real and symmetric, then what we're going to get when we look at how often 
um, you know, if we look at this maximization problem, <coughs> that we're interested in solving in this theorem, well, that's the same thing just using the standard trace identities as m, the trace of m times x tensor 2 times x tensor 2 transpose. Here I use transpose because it's, uh, it's real value. So this right here is the probability that some test passes, that it ends up with some outcome in quantum mechanics. And so it turns out that when you view things, you know, we can naturally want to solve polynomial optimization problems like the thing on the left-hand side. But what that really relates to quantum mechanics is, for example, figuring out the probability that a separable state passes some test. So why is it separable? Because I don't have an arbitrary PSD n squared by n squared matrix here. I have one which is really x tensor 2 times x tensor 2 transpose. Yep? Just to understand this definition of separable, so why doesn't 0, 0 plus 1, 1 state get captured by this? So this is one of the EPR pairs. Uh -huh. so, uh, that's not separable, right? Or yeah. That's not separable, yeah. So why can I not write it as a convex? Convex? So um, can I take that off? I mean, that uh, it's going to take me to Braun Ket notation, but uh, you're already using that in your inner product, so <laughs> <laughs> no. But I promised I wouldn't, so I can't. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going I'm to have to take that one offline. But um, let's chat afterwards about why. Uh, you know, the maximally entangled state doesn't meet these conditions. But, um, you know, one way to think about it is, for example, looking at tests and seeing that you can express the correlations between them as a purely classical way in terms of the correlations of the different subsystems. Okay, so, you know, I want to, I'm going to get to this proof, or at least, you know, how to use this principle of pretending you have a distribution and fixing it later. But, um, you know, I do want to mention, for example, that, you know, some of the types of problems that uh, people study within quantum information theory. So one really nice result, uh, this was studied by Brandau. Sandel. and yard, and 11, was really a dual problem, which is a very natural question, which is if you're given some quantum state, which is not necessarily separable, well, what you could want to do is you could want to figure out how close to separable it is. So in that sense, what you want to do is you want to find some test m that maximizes trace of m rho minus the max over all rho prime that are separable of the trace of m rho prime. So you can think about it, you know, if I give you a state rho, you want to figure out whether this state is separable. That's a very natural goal within quantum. And one way to try and figure out if it is or isn't separable or how far it's away from being separable is to try and find a test that distinguishes it from the set of separable states. This is some convex body that's hard to characterize. It's something that's very unwieldy to express in terms of sum of squares, and we'll see that later. So if, for example, your row really was separable, then you know, finding this test, you're always going to get 0. You're never going to have a test that actually distinguishes it from separable. But if, for example, you have a row that's far from separable, being able to approximately solve this maximization problem of finding a test m where this quantity is as large as possible is a certificate that your state is far from separable. So the same way that you, know, you can solve polynomial optimization in quasi-polynomial time, what Brandau et al. were doing was they were using the same types of SOS tools to approximately solve these types of problems up to some additive epsilon that depends on the spectral norm of m. And that's really like being able to approximately decide whether your given state rho is close to the set of separable states in some norm that depends on, for example, how you constrain m. <clears throat> 
So this stuff gets a little bit unwieldy because very quickly, you know, we're used to like spectral norms and trace norms. But uh, there's something called um, the one-way LOCC norm, which is how they proved it. And uh, it's a very complicated norm that requires a lot of quantum to define. But this is roughly the spirit of these types of results, is polynomial optimization also relates to this quantum problem of given some norm, figuring out how close your state rho is to being separable or not. And there are also quasi-polynomial time algorithms that work based on the same types of SOS technology. All right, so this was enough of a digression about quantum, and I'm going to come back to quantum later. But now I want to tell you, you know, how this proof works and how this principle can be applied, because it sounds very mysterious right now. So is yeah. that restriction to real uh, for computational reasons, or it's just not? Um, I only know of the, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's actually extended. To, uh, I think the Brandau et al. result works for quantum, but don't quote me on that. But take that offline. OK, so now I want to illustrate this principle. Let's go through this uh, proof of this theorem and use this principle of let's pretend we have a real distribution on our solutions to our polynomial optimization problem. And we're going to fix the argument later. So let's prove. I'll put a tilde, because it's a pseudo proof, this result. OK, so the idea is that we start off with, you know, suppose we're given a distribution on unit vectors. Which achieve value gamma. OK? So what this means is that um, you know, someone's going to give you access to a distribution on the vectors x. So that the expectation, remember m is really a degree 4 polynomial. So the expectation of p of x when you take x from that distribution is at least gamma. So someone gave you a distribution on unit vectors that makes the four, degree 4 polynomial have expected value at least gamma. Now one question we could ask is you know, how do we actually find a solution that actually achieves good value? <laughs> You know, all we have access to is the distribution, and we want to use access only to the distribution to figure out how to round it to a single good solution for the polynomial. So here's the idea. We want to try and find a single unit vector with value close to that. Now, just like we had this additive epsilon approximation to our polynomial optimization problem, we have the same relaxation here. You give me a distribution on solutions with expected value gamma. All I'm going to ask you is to produce one unit vector that achieves value at least gamma minus epsilon. So here's the idea. Let's just write down, and just for simplicity, I'm going to normalize things. So let's say that m has unit spectral norm. Now the idea is let's translate what we have. So D is our distribution on solutions. And we have the property that sum over IJKL of M IJKL XI XJ XK XL is at least gamma. Someone gave me the distribution whose expected value on the polynomial is at least gamma. So there's a natural way to try and round this into just a single vector. So let's try the following. We're going to let x star, it's going to be a unit vector, where of length n, where the ith coordinate is equal to square root of the expectation of d of xi squared. So someone gives me the distribution and I'm allowed to evaluate moments or expectations of polynomials. One way to turn that into a unit vector is just to do the simple translation. You give me access to the expectation of the distribution. I compute this value for each coordinate i. And the first claim is that this really is a unit vector. 
This is really simple. What do we do? Well, we just compute its norm. So we look at the sum of squares for this guy. And that's the same thing, just using the definition of the expectation over D of Xi squared. Now we bring in the sum inside. So it's the expectation over D of the sum over I of Xi squared. That's just the definition. But the key point is that this distribution is only a distribution on unit vectors. So this quantity in here is always 1 if it really were a distribution on unit vectors. So this is just some way of taking our distribution on solutions and doing something coordinate wise to try and find a guess x star, which hopefully solves our optimization problem of finding one particular solution that makes this degree 4 polynomial be large. The trouble is that this doesn't always work. Otherwise, we could call it a day pretty easily. So let's um, understand what can go wrong and uh, how we can fix what's going wrong. So, so the difference, the point here is you're not allowed to sample from the distribution. You're just allowed to evaluate test functions. Yes, exactly. So the way I've asked this question, it sounds kind of trivial. If someone gave me a distribution that does all of the hard work, right? You could just sample from it and take a typical vector. But here I'm only going to be able to compute moments to find my guess. Why? Because the reality is when I remove this tilde and I actually want to prove it, I have to move the tilde everywhere here and I only have pseudo expectations. So you can't sample from a pseudo expectation because it's honestly not an expectation. There is no distribution that meets those conditions. So if we can do something using this framework where we don't actually sample from the distribution, then we can actually translate this to an actual proof that goes from the pseudo expectation to an actual vector. But thanks for that point. All right, so let's do this. So let's understand if its objective value is much smaller. So let's imagine that it's too small for our purposes. So imagine we take this x star and we plug it into our polynomial optimization problem. So we take its tensor with itself and we look at its quadratic form on the matrix M. So what if it's too small? It's actually gamma minus epsilon. So no good. We're going to have to figure out some other way to find our unit vector. But the idea is the following is we're going to define some notion of making progress on this distribution, how we're actually simplifying it to a lower entropy distribution. Uh, every time this type of condition happens. So I'm going to consider one other vector. So I'm going to let y be the n squared dimensional vector. It's a unit vector for the same reasons. Where yij is the square root of the expectation of d of xi squared xj squared. So y is a length n squared dimensional vector. And here's you know, the same way that I computed x star just from the individual moments. I can create y through pairwise moments using this type of property. But the crucial point is that the same way that rounding to x star could have made our solution worse, it turns out that rounding to y only makes our solution value larger. It's just not a valid solution to our original optimization problem because no one tells me that y is actually the tensor of two unit vectors. So let's prove that you know, if x star is smaller, you know, y, star, y is larger. And then we'll understand you know, what's going wrong when we have too small an objective value. So what I claim is the following. Well, gamma is, by definition, jkl m i j k l the expectation over d of x i x j x k and x l right uh, i guess less than or equal to so now what we can do is we can just apply cauchy schwartz so cauchy schwartz tells us that this is less than or equal to m i j k l square root times the expectation 
over d of xi squared xj squared. That is the same thing for k and l. So the way to think about this is you could, you know, m by definition, uh, by assumption is non-negative. You could just think about m as just being all ones for simplicity to see why this follows from Cauchy-Schwartz. And then you're just applying it on the resulting, you know, constituent vectors. I'm bracketing these two together and considering them as a vector. You know, over my realizations of my distribution, I get this out for its two norm. And I bracket these two and consider it as a vector over the realization of my distribution, I get this guy. But now we're in business because this guy right here is just yij. That's how we defined it. And this guy right here is yKl. So what this means is that at the end of the day, we found some vector y, which is not a valid solution because y is not the tensor of a unit vector with itself. But we have found a y which makes the objective value on m at least as large as the expectation was. So now we want to understand what's happened when x star, the individual coordinate wise rounding, is very different in objective value than the pairwise rounding, which we get for y. So what does it mean that this value is at least gamma, but this value is at most gamma minus epsilon? It turns out there's a sense in which what that means is that um, there is uh, there's an underlying distribution where we can look at entropy of that, the, you know, the, the two coordinates, how much one tells us about the other. And it's really saying the only way that we can have this objective be larger than this one is if there is information going on in the correlations between these coordinates. So we'll find a way of reducing that amount of mutual information to try and make progress towards finding a unit vector. So let me uh, explain what this means now, the state of affairs when we have x star doesn't work, but y is certainly at least as large. All right, so putting it all together, We know that epsilon is a lower bound on the difference between these two quadratic forms. One we get from y, and the other we get from x star. Right. That's just the situation we're in. So now we can write this out in another way, which we can write it as a quadratic form. One where I subtract y from x star, tensor with itself, and the other one where I add the two. It's just elementary algebra. So this guy right here, I'm just going to upper bound. That's, you know, these two guys are unit vectors, so the sum of them has not too large norm. So let me just create a really loose upper bound. And remember, by assumption, we had that m's operator norm was at most 1. We fixed that normalization. So at the end of the day, what this means is that we have the following upper bound on this quadratic form. Is It's at most the difference between y and x star tensored with itself. That quantity is at least epsilon. So let's translate what this means. So what I claim is that uh, this quantity right here can be interpreted information theoretically. So let's just try and understand what's going on here. So the way that this is going to work is we're going to consider two random variables. w and w prime, which are both distributions over some set n by n. So each random variable just tells me an index from 1 to n and another index from 1 to n. Right? And what these random variables are, let's define them in terms of x star and y. 
So I'm going to set the probability that this random variable w is equal to the pair ij. Those are just two indices from 1 to n. That I'm going to let it be the expectation over d of xi squared xj squared. That's some quantity. So why is this a probability? It's just because the sum over all ij of this guy is 1. So this takes my unit vector and defines some probability distribution associated with it. And the same way, I'm going to define the probability of w prime as equal to ij is the pair of independent random variables. So what I promised you was I wanted to define two random variables, w and w prime, which are both two different distributions over pairs of indices from 1 to n. The way that the random variables are defined is through these identities. w is the random variable which on a pair ij has this probability of being ij. And w prime is the one that has this probability. Now these are distributions just because the fact that y and x star are both unit vectors. Now the important thing is w prime, i and j are independent of each other. Literally it's the product of two probabilities. It's the same random variable we would get by choosing the index i according to these values, xi squared, and choosing j according to these values, xj squared. Whereas this one actually incorporates the pairwise relationship between the indices. These are playing the roles of y and x star respectively. So what I claim is that this quantity, the fact that y and x star tensor 2 is at least epsilon, this turns out to actually be, this is related to the Hellinger distance in information theory. So if we look at the two random variables, the coordinate i and the coordinate j, the only way that we can have these two differences, the one that we get by looking at pairwise moments and the ones we get by doing things independently, be noticeably different is if there is some information and correlation between i and j. So that's the idea, is that the only way that y could have had a larger quadratic form than what x star gets is if there's some correlation between these two coordinates. So now the idea is the following. <clears throat> say this. So if we let capital W be W1, W2. So this is the random variable. So what this means is that y minus x star tensor 2 has Euclidean norm at least epsilon over 2. Turns out that tells you that the mutual information between the random variables w1 and w2 is at least something depending on epsilon. That's the sort of key idea. Is that, um, <clears throat> see if we had um, the mutual information between these two variables w1 and w2 being zero, then actually the distributions w and w prime we get out are the same. Because the only way that the mutual information between the two coordinates is 0 is if they're actually independent, which means that we get exactly the same expression here. So the fact that w and w prime, which give you y and x star respectively for the unit vectors that they're associated with, give you different objective values, just means that these two random variables aren't that close to being independent. So you know that there actually is mutual information between them. So now here's the idea. Can you say what mutual information is? Yep. <laughs> so mutual information between w1 and w2, you can define it many different ways. But you can look at the loss in entropy. So for example, if w1 and w2 were the same random variable, then when I condition on w2, I have no more entropy left in w1. So my mutual information is exactly the entropy of w1. So it's the idea is how much one coordinate tells you about the other. 
The completely equivalent way to define it is with h of w2 minus h of w2 conditioned on w1. So it's really telling you that you know, when I fix w2, how much of the randomness have I taken out of w1? So the sort of key takeaway is that the only way that we have a difference between objective value between x star and y is if fixing one of the coordinates tells me a lot about the other. But that's going to be our progress measure, is when you encounter the situation where your naive rounding x star doesn't work, what you're going to do is you're going to tell me one of the coordinates. And that's going to reduce the amount of entropy in the other coordinate so that I get closer and closer to being not a distribution and actually having one solution for my optimization problem. Yep? Where's the uh, 1 8 come from? Why is it not 1 4? Where is it not? Um, yeah, so OK, so this is, this is a Hellinger distance. So you really have to use the relationship between Hellinger and mutual information and KL divergence. And honestly, I didn't feel like looking up what the right constant was, so I put 8. <laughs> so it's definitely 8 at least. But uh, you could optimize that. Hmm? So it's not coming from squaring that epsilon over 2. No, yeah, I mean, so it's um, when you do Pinsker's inequality, so you really have to use you know, the version of Hellinger that relates it to TV and KL divergence. And then there are some constants the same way that there are constants in Pinsker. So I, I wrote the 8 just for slack. <laughs> uh, any other questions? All right. So let's do this. All right. So just to translate this, what this means is that um, you know, what this mutual information means, if we condition on W2, then uh, the entropy of W1 drops by at least epsilon squared over 8. That's exactly what this relationship means. As we start off with this random variable w1, and the only way that they have mutual information between w1 and w2 is if when we condition on w2, we actually reduce the entropy of the new random variable w1 conditioned on w2. But see, what I claim is that um, the entropy of w1 couldn't have been that large to begin with. So w1 is a distribution on n different things. So the entropy at the beginning is at most log n. You know, whenever you have a random variable, the maximum entropy distribution for it is just uniform on the domain, which is entropy log n. So what this means is we're making progress. We started off with something which had entropy log n. And we tried this naive rounding where we constructed x star. But x star might not work. The only way that x star doesn't work is if there's some mutual information between the coordinates. And when we condition on one of the coordinates, that reduces the remaining entropy on the first one. So we're making progress towards it. So this is exactly where this quasi-polynomial comes in from these polynomial optimization problems, is that entropy is your underlying potential function. You start off with at most log n bits of entropy. And every time you're reducing the entropy where you don't find an actual solution by at least epsilon squared. That's why the running time of these polynomial optimization problems and the things from quantum information theory depends exponentially on log n over epsilon squared. It comes from this sort of potential function. So let me briefly tell you the idea now. But um, the idea is that just summarizing everything together. So either x star, this naive rounding, works, meaning that it achieves value, at least gamma minus epsilon. Or we can condition on j and get a new distribution. where the entropy is dropped. Let me just translate this into what this really means. So what this means is, in the situation here, where you really need to make progress, what you do is you choose i according 
to the following distribution. Remember, i is just the distribution on 1 through n. So the probability you choose coordinate 1 is just x1 squared. The probability you choose coordinate 2 is the expectation of x2 squared, and so on, all the way out to xn squared. So this is a probability distribution. You choose the coordinate i according to this distribution. And then what you do is you choose j according to the new marginal distribution. So you've got to normalize it. You know, I chose some xi. So I need to normalize it by whatever that probability was of making that choice. But the new vector that I use to construct my next sample xj is I take xi squared and look at x1 squared. That's the probability, that's proportional probability my next choice for j is 1. And then I do the same thing for all of the other coordinates. And so on, all the way out to xn squared. So the point is you can prove the same way using the same types of identities we already had that this is also a distribution. So all this is literally doing is it's taking the distribution w and it's marginally choosing what i is and then choosing j according to the correct conditional distribution. See, instead of j being independent like it is in w prime, it now depends on what my choice of i was. So there are some pairs which you have a larger probability. This is a different distribution for every different i. So the idea is that this you can now use to simplify your distribution. So if hypothetically someone gave you a distribution on solutions and they gave you access to some very high moments of the distribution, you either start off with x star, that works for your rounding algorithm, or if it doesn't work, you're going to make one of the choices you know, for i and you're going to look at the new distribution you get out from it. That new distribution on solutions is the way you generate your next guess for x star and you try that guy out. And you keep doing this for log n over epsilon squared rounds, that many moments of conditioning. And the point is I can't keep encountering this problem where you know x star didn't work but y did because eventually I'm going to run out of entropy. So that's the idea behind the proof. This is the sort of principle. You know, a lot of these things in SOS get pretty technical. So this is a sort of hand wavy way to do it, which it illustrates this principle that the way that you try and round a pseudo expectation, it's always you think of it as a distribution on honestly solutions, but you're only allowed some limited interaction with that distribution. You can't just sample from the distribution. Instead, you have to figure out how to round it just using its moments. You do it by cheating, by pretending it actually is a distribution and proving that you find a good solution in a small number of steps. And then you make all of these different inequalities work even if there were pseudo distributions and not distributions. So you literally have to check that all of the different steps that you use in here, be, it, be they things like Cauchy-Schwartz, for example, the way that we use Cauchy-Schwartz here, are things that actually can be implemented within the sum of squares proof system. And so they work not just for distributions, but even for pseudo distributions. And this is how polynomial optimization works for these types of things. Maybe I, maybe I missed it, but uh, did you, or did you use that m was non-negative? I used it right here in the Cauchy-Schwartz. So if m weren't non-negative, then I couldn't do this step. Because okay. for example, even if I have one negative coordinate, game is over. Yep. So here you're only computing expectations of monomials. Yep. So do you actually need the full power of some of squares? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So um, see, what you really need is that when I condition on here, I want that the resulting distribution I get is also a good solution to my polynomial optimization problem. So in fact, the, you know, the SOS, the way that you write it, is that not only is the original solution good in terms of maximizing it and it meets all these PSD constraints, but for every choice of you know, i, the new distribution I get out x star, which depends on the choice of that i, will also be a good solution. And for every choice of i and j, it'll also be a good solution. I do that for log n you know, length. And that you know, still has a feasible solution because the actual solution, which is just one value and is a distribution supported on that one evaluation, has the property that when you condition on i in this way, 
you don't actually change the solution. Right, right. But I'm saying you don't condition an arbitrary polynomial. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, you, I mean, in all these things, the rounding algorithms only ever end up using a subset of the actual inequalities. So one sort of interesting direction, which you know, I'm not really going to get into, is a lot of times once you have these rounding algorithms, you can look at what actual things you're using in the proof and sometimes get faster algorithms. So this is like um, this work on speeding up sum of squares that sometimes you can even get the power out of higher order SOS relaxations without actually going up to that degree of matrix polynomial. The power that you're prove. Yeah. yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah. So when you encounter things like entropy, yeah. you encounter things like logarithm and things yeah. that are necessary polynomials, how do you, uh, how do you deal with the inequalities relating entropy to so this is um, uh, so this is, for example, you know, you can instead work with Hellinger directly, which instead of actually translating it to how much the entropy is lost, there's a way just to do it natively within the Hellinger distance, which is defined in terms of the Euclidean distance between y and you know x star tensor two. So the difference between a pairwise distribution and the product of its two independent marginals. But that's a great question, and that happens all when you try and remove the tilde in my pseudo proof. In scarce inequality, can you prove it using SOS? Uh, I don't know of how to prove that, but that's not what you end up using to sort of make this uh, go through. Yep. Can you go with the algorithm again if x star doesn't work? Yep. So you pick one coordinate? Yep. I mean, oh, according to the distribution. That's right. And then you fix it? Yep. And then you condition on? For all the way. Yep. Yep. The yep. Exactly. So the point is, the way that I defined x star, it only depended on these guys right here. So the way that when I condition on i, I define my new x star is with this vector. If I take the entrywise square root of this guy you know, with the right normalization, that'll also be a unit vector because this is a distribution. And that's my new one. But I might have to go even further out if the next one doesn't work. So basically you iterate over the i's, but then for the j's you actually write down all the n minus 1. Seconds. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. And then the next time you have like two yep. i's. Yep. Yep. OK, so I do want to say one more thing, and then we can uh, do more questions. So I guess I don't have time to talk about this. But it turns out there's this interesting relation between this and quantum DeFinetti theorems. So DeFinetti theorems are the setting where what you have in the classical setting is you have variables x1 through xn which are what are called exchangeable. And what that means is that when I take a permutation of any of these variables, I get the same resulting distribution. So one natural way to get exchangeability is by having these variables xi be iid. That would certainly be an exchangeable thing. But it's not the only way. Because one thing that I can do is I can, for example, take um, some variable theta, let's say to be uniform on the interval 0, 1. And then each xi could be a Bernoulli random variable with this common probability theta. So these now are actually exchangeable, but they're not actually iid. Because once I realize x1, that tells me something about theta. But it's still true that every permutation is the same. So what ends up happening is that when you have high exchangeability, this is the only thing that can happen. You're actually close to being conditionally independent random variables. So what's actually going on here is that the solution in the pseudo expectation is actually a quantum state that has a lot of symmetries. It's quantumly exchangeable, meaning that any of the subsystems that you get out in different permutations are exactly the same. Uh, the same way that in classical DeFinetti, you control how close you are to being conditionally independent, the notion of conditionally dependent in quantum is actually being close to separable. So it turns out that you know, this polynomial optimization problem that we wanted to solve was related to finding the best agreement in a separable state. But what we're really doing is we're, con we're constructing a highly symmetric composite state. So how high order is it? It depends on the degree of the pseudo expectation. But the fact that um, you know, it's exchangeable, that it's so highly symmetric, is really the thing that's happening in this rounding algorithm. It's saying that you know, the distribution I get first is the same as the every distribution I get by conditioning on i and so on. And that's the quantum notion of exchangeability, which tells you that you're close to being a separable state and that you're close to being uh, 
the optimizer to a polynomial optimization problem. So there's a, you know, a lot of very interesting work on you know, how to relate this to quantum definite theorems, where you know, something that's neat is there are information theoretic ways through mutual information to prove classical definite theorems. But in quantum, you use something called the monogamy of entanglement. So uh, now that I've gone halfway through what I wanted to get to, I think we'll stop there. And uh, part five and six will be tomorrow. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So thanks. And any questions you guys have, be happy to answer. So I'm um, always like a bit confused with these entropy arguments in the sense of, you know, like log n entropy is like the worst case, but then if you're really at log n entropy, then it would be separable, mm -hmm. right? Because then it would be a product. And has, is there is that like completely hopeless to try and pretend to take advantage? Oh, uh, uh, I don't know about that. So. Um, so for example, how could I have log n entropy for my marginal distribution on i? i equals j. And it's random from 1 to n. So that's a case where actually my entropy starting off for h of w1 is actually log n because it's uniform. Yeah, I mean, in this case, log n is really 2 log n. But like, yeah, yeah I, that's I, right. I, that's I mean, right. Yeah, yeah, yep, yep. Yeah, exactly. You're right that if you look at pairwise, you know, the entropy of w1 comma w2, then um, you know, if that is maximum and it's two log n and not log n, then you really are, um, you know, exactly independent. But some of this is funny because the other thing is that there are many ways of defining what independent random variables are. You know, I could say that i and j are independent if and only if their mutual information is zero. That's true. But there are many equivalent ways through other information theoretic notions of defining what independence means. I could also define it through Hellinger as in, you know, the Euclidean norm of this guy is zero. But some are more and less quantitative when you relax that in the sense that if I only have mutual information epsilon or epsilon squared, how close am I to being independent? So that's, you know, a little bit technical, but that's one of the issues is that it depends on how you measure independence and how it works when you add soft constraints to it. But also one of the subtleties, which I'm far from being an expert in, is all these quantum results, they depend a lot on the norm. So when you look for an M that you want to you know, have uh, maximally distinguish your state from the set of separable states, it depends on what types of constraints you impose on M. You get all sorts of different norms. So by no means are like quantum definite theorems, which are related to this, uh, really exhaustively understood. Because when you strengthen the norm, is it possible to get you know, good bounds for how close you are to being separable? And what are the best possible rates? There's you know, lots and lots of papers on this. Yep. Yes, the, the running time comes because in the SVP, you want these conditional distributions to have, well, good enough moments that you can do Cauchy Schwartz. Exactly. Time, right? That's exactly right. You're not actually iterating over i. You're actually sampling. That's right. Entropy is a distributional. That's exactly right. Exactly. Yep. So, uh, so the way you isolated the solution here was you know, getting this vector, which is expressible linearly or polynomially in terms of the moments. Mm -hmm. But uh, generally in this framework, do you need to be able to do that where you express it linearly or polynomially, or you can just use the moments in any way? The first well, of so one thing is that you know, if I had some other way of going from my distribution to my candidate solution as a way to round this, you know, it could be that if that function is a bit more complex than this linear or polynomial, if I then used Cauchy-Schwartz, Who's to say whether, you know, I can definitely do Cauchy Schwartz on the new vector, but whether that translates into constraints in the pseudo expectation depends on what function you choose for it. So that's a, exactly. So that's a little bit tricky. Like it's not formulaic for how to do this, but, uh, and by no means does everything that pretends it's a distribution and then rounds it necessarily give you an actual algorithm. You have to be careful in which inequalities you're using and that all of those inequalities really do have a realization in terms of you know, either proof complexity, how to you know, prove them using sum of squares, or how to derive them from the pseudo expectation properties. Which inequalities do you actually use in the full proof? Uh, like, is there, some, is there, is there a clear understanding that yeah, you can basically do everything with Cauchy Schwartz if you do it? So Cauchy-Schwartz is definitely one of the most powerful for you know, most of the rounding algorithms. You know, the algorithms that come out of SOS use 
Cauchy-Schwartz, but there's also something called PPT symmetries, which are really important. That, um, you know, there are other things which were in my notes, which I don't have time to talk about, where, for example, you're talking about refuting random three CSPs. So when you're talking about refuting second order CSPs like random 2SAT or 2XOR, you can turn that into a matrix problem where eigenvalue bounds on random matrices give you certificates that the CSP is unsatisfiable. When you work with odd order things, one of the standard tricks is to use resolution to turn it into an even order thing. So for example, you could take two uh, clauses which are on three variables and do resolution and create one clause on four variables. But those types of things, when you then try and turn that into random matrix theory, it's a dependent random matrix theory. And it can be really sensitive to how you index it. Like if I take you know, a pair of clauses you know, I on variables i, j, k, and something else that shares it, you know, i prime, j prime, and k prime. And I do resolution, for example, in XOR, and create some clause on i, j, i prime, and j prime. How I map this into a matrix of n squared by n squared, it actually completely changes what spectral bounds you can prove, whether you use this pair to index the row or this pair to index the row. The fact that they came from the same constraint means that uh, you don't get good spectral bounds. So there are also what are called like PPT symmetries that are very useful in conjunction with Cauchy-Schwartz. Right.